Um, my name is JJ Gonson. I am the proprietor of a catering company called Cuisine en Locale, which is the was the leaseholder on the space that was known as Once in Somerville on Highland Ave. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Cambridge. I grew up in Cambridge, and I lived in Somerville. Well, I've, I've lived in this part of the world a lot. I've gone away a lot too. <laughs> I know that even as we speak, there are gatherings going on that are fantastic. Maybe online or maybe in person. I'm guessing there's stuff happening outside that nobody knows about. And the people that are participating in that are probably very excited about the renaissance mm -hmm. of the arts and culture scene. I'm excited about a renaissance of the arts and culture scene. I'm, I feel like it, there's, it's not just about when you're somewhere, but how you're there. And so um, I was in, for the 90s, I was in Portland, Oregon, and I'm very excited about the renaissance that I experienced there. But I think these things come around, and I think it's more about how you interact with them. And I think that Boston has been, Boston is an unusual, as we all know, it's a college town, right? Yeah. So it changes in ways that other places don't. And when I moved to Oregon, I was very surprised to discover that the city that I was living in, like a lot of the people there had grown up together and gone to high school together, and it hadn't changed mm. enormously in the time, in their lifetimes. That changed, unfortunately. But Boston, my experience of Boston is, you know, every September you have the zombie mobs of new students wandering into traffic and not knowing anything about what's popular or not popular. It's like bands get a reset every September. They get to fight again for the, for the limelight because nobody knows. It's tabula rasa. So Boston changes a lot because of that. I see the world in pictures. Um, I don't know if everyone sees the world in pictures, but I do. And um, I got my first camera when I was five, probably, and that was a little Instamatic, fantastic little Kodak Instamatic thing. And then I got my first SLR, which was a very low-end, inexpensive SLR. It's a Minolta. Um, it, it was a, I, I adored it completely actually wasn't completely manual which was its undoing it had this weird touch sensor in the in the um, shutter which was an awful idea because if it was too cold it didn't work but um, I loved it and I had very cheap lenses Vivitar lenses and I shot um, rock bands with that camera through the 80s but it all has to do with be, like that I'm shooting whatever's in front of me at any given time. So like earlier today, I took a picture of daffodils with a pile of Vinci chocolate because I was like, oh, it's such a beautiful time of year for chocolate and flowers. But nobody wants to see those pictures. They want to see the pictures of Henry Rollins in a tiny, tiny pair of shorts. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love public art. You know, I think Instagram is almost another form of public art and, um, and folk art. Mm -hmm at the same time. I'm not, I, I feel like I've been very, very deeply sucked into social media during the pandemic. I think a lot of people who would say that, and I am very tied into it because there's nobody really left at my companies. So it's kind of down to like me and a couple other people. So I'm the one who has to keep on all the social media. Yeah. So I feel like I spend a lot of time on social media, but at least on Instagram, I feel like it speaks to seeing the world in pictures, which is... Oh, 1,000%, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do, do you feel like starting once was kind of a natural extension of what you've already been doing for your life? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, um, I didn't start once intentionally. I rented this space to house my catering company, Cuisine Locale. And um, I, I just kind of, like, I needed to use that room for something, and I had a lot of connections to the music scene. So I just kind of worked my connections with the music scene. Cool. And it became what it became <laughs> <laughs> yeah. over time. And I feel like it's a very community-driven project. I mean, I, 
I recognize that that my at the end of the day if a decision has to be made it comes to me and that I set a tone right so there's certain things that I don't tolerate or mm -hmm. I think are integral to who we are but a lot of it is driven by the community there is a starvation going on yeah. at venues in Boston because um, the, 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 the major outlets have created such a chokehold mm. on the venues that um, it, it's very, it's, it's even harder than usual to be an independent venue. Like it was already hard, yeah, and now it's even harder. And as I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of an organization called NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association, and um, it, we're, we're not normal. I don't think people understand that. Like when you go to other major markets, you go to Austin or Nashville, they're not dominated by AEG and Live Nation. There are AEG and Live Nation rooms, but to, you know, a hundred rooms, two are AEG and Live Nation. Whereas here, we have eight. Like when people started sentimentalizing about closed rooms and they're like Brighton Music Hall and the Paradise and House of Blues and the Sinclair. It's like, yeah, you know, they'll all be back because those are the Live Nation and AEG rooms. They'll all be back. They have very deep pockets and yeah, they got hurt. They did. They got hurt. But you know what? They're the ones right now sitting by the side of the governor going, we need this and this and this and this and this and they're going to get it because mm -hmm. they're there and they've been there the whole time. So people in Boston don't, un they don't understand that like that's unusual. That's unusual. There's, there's really very, very few small rooms and a lot of them just closed. Mm -hmm. We lost, and you know, being like, oh yeah, we lost TTs and Johnny D's. Like the reason that was so horrifying, the reason that losing once and Bull McCabe's is so horrifying, is because we don't have anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't think, we lost the Milky Way. I don't think there's a single woman owned venue left in Boston. I think that was it. We're done. That's it. No women. And the uh, one of the one of the great frustrations I have in the Boston scene is that it is actually horribly divided and uninclusive and segregated. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's it could it could stand to be a lot more inclusive because a lot of the independent rooms don't even make it onto the indie rock radars. Sometimes I think that the things that I'm saying, I'm saying because they're obvious, right? So I, to me it was just automatic that we had to keep our community talking and we were going into the spring and we were doing a lot of music and so I, I it was just sort of like to me the obvious thing that we were gonna keep producing even if it was virtually, we were already, we had just captured some stuff. So the first thing was just to launch stuff we already had. And then we still had the venue and people were sending us videos. So it just felt to me like, a, like it all sort of just came together, much like the venue did. Mm -hmm. But I was listening to something today that was really good. It was really good. It was a talk um, from McLean's about mental health in a time of the uncontrollable, right? When you can't control anything, how do you stay? How do you, how do you survive that? And um, one of the things that she said was, um, because people were like, you know, we can't make music. And it was directed to the, to the industry. It was amazing. And, and she said, well, one of the things that you can do, and she came from a musical family, is you can, you can, you know, musicians are getting online and they're creating music together in other ways and they're having small gatherings. And I thought, you know, props to my team for protecting each other and each other's health in this way where we all immediately identified that that was something that we needed and we all kind of asked each other for it very quickly. And props to the music community that I'm a part of for intuitively protecting each other, sort of circling the wagons, as it were, or 
doing that thing penguins do, <laughs> where they all face in and use their body heat. Like, I feel like, um, so moving to the virtual world has been incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, it's been a little bit of a reassurance as we lost the space, which is, I can't even tell you how awful. Um, so it's been a little bit of a consolation to have a place to see people and to know that we're still loved. Um, but it, 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 there's been a lot of stuff that I haven't actually had a lot to do with. I was like, we're gonna do this thing, figure it out. And then there's three people that have spent a lot of hours lying awake trying to figure out why something didn't work, why something went down. You know, we tested the stream a thousand times. How come it froze? What was the thing that was going on in the space at that moment? Like, they've worked very, very, very hard. And what we've come up with is Zoom to YouTube. You know, like, what have we all come up with? Twitch, Zoom, YouTube. Nobody's really moved past that yet from what I can tell. We will. We will. There's going to be better platforms. It won't be long. But so far, it seems like that's... That's what we got, OBS. I hope that the virtual venue, there's a, when we started, we, we launched on May 1st. That was our birthday, we're coming up on it. Um, when we launched, we did it very quickly. Like I said, it was just kind of, I was like, okay, now we're gonna do this thing. Here we go. And I remember a couple of people being like, but the bands, and I was like, they'll figure it out. <laughs> and they did, <laughs> really, really fast. And I knew they would. <laughs> bands. It's always all on poor bands. So, uh, bless them. So we, uh, I, I am hoping that this year that we've invested and in, put our PPP money into, put a, a huge amount of love into, sold t-shirts to support, launched a GoFundMe, you know, all this stuff that we've done to keep people working and to keep money moving out hopefully to artists. And we have, we've paid out, you know, a couple thousand dollars to artists. We, um, and more, we, uh, we, I, I, I don't want to just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, we have created a thing and I'm proud of it and I think that it provides an accessibility that's very important. It's a platform. At this time, the platform only has so much reach, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep working on that. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open in a space where we create, um, a, a video setup that's installed with good Wi-Fi and you know built in with like you know I, I sort of imagined it in my mind a little bit the way that I, I worked in theater for a long time and I actually was an electrician I worked in lighting and I'd be up in the catwalks and hanging lights and you have infrastructure you have grids and you have scaffolds and you have you know what do they call that stuff trust your trust <laughs> so trust is awesome let's have some trust right let's have a place to mount those cameras let's have a place to mount those lights i think that we have an opportunity now to create that and i'm excited about it yeah, I remember that one. all right like share subscribe uh really for real if you can go to our youtube which is once virtual venue o-n-c-e virtual venue um Please subscribe, please share a video, please like as many videos as you can stand to like. It does help. It does get us out in front of eyes, ultimately creating a scenario where we can charge for tickets, we can pay bands. It's really helpful. Uh, follow us on Facebook for more information about shows. Also, oncesomerville.com is not only our calendar and a link to YouTube and GoFundMe, and all that stuff but also we have a merch store called shopperville where you can get beautiful things like this hat that says no crowd surfing because that was a thing <laughs> that was a thing and uh yeah oh and patreon we have a patreon and you it starts i think at two dollars a month and patreon is great because not only does it amplify but it also gives us a base so we know, like we have $1,000 a month coming from Patreon and we can count on that $1,000 a month to pay for the insurance bill that we, can't that we can't avoid if we ever want to be a company again. 
<laughs> well, well, thank you so much. Save, Save our stages. Yes. I was waiting for that. Say it one more time when I'm not interrupting you. Save our stages. <laughs>